sir. Firstly, welcome. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the honor of uh, you visiting us. Huge fan. Uh, I know. <laughs> star, like, you know, you're a huge fan of your uh, rock star like uh, cult following because you know you are a very very different uh, you know Guruji because you know people look up to you especially the youths, the youngsters look up to you and they they really take uh, a lot of uh, pride in supporting all the causes you champion. So, but let me quickly introduce you to my state, sir, uh, state Telangana. Telangana, as you know, is the youngest state in India. In fact, uh, it was formed uh, almost eight years ago in 2014, June 2nd. And uh, the subject that is close to your heart is also very, very close to our Honorable Chief Minister's heart. Uh, in fact, he is a very, very passionate uh, environmentalist. And uh, he's somebody who really takes a lot of pride in, um, in all the causes that you espouse, in fact. I don't think you've had a chance to interact with him uh, directly, but uh, it does, you know, talk quite a bit about you and your uh, kind of work that you do. So, uh, one of the things we have done, which uh, we take a lot of pride, is a program called Harita Haram. Now, Harita Haram is the third largest effort in human history. Uh, you know, where uh, government of Telangana has taken it upon itself to plan nearly 230 crore satings, almost 2.3 billion satings. And so, uh, what we've also done to ensure the survival, because Plantation, plantation by itself is not enough, planting by itself is not enough. So in our municipal and panchayati raj acts, the two legislations that we brought in, we have earmarked about 10% of the budget of both villages and municipalities for green, green initiative. So it's called the green budget, 10%. And the second thing we have done, sir, I think which has brought in a lot of accountability, a lot of responsibility on the public representatives, is that if we do not ensure the concerned Sikh Panchayat Sarpanch or the local ward councillor does not ensure 85% of survival of the saplings that have been planted. He can be fired. His job uh, can be he can be removed from his job. He is an elected representative. Yes, but, but as per legislation, uh, the elected representative has certain roles and responsibilities, and if he doesn't fulfil it, uh, you know there is a re uh, reason why he should be removed. We wanted to ensure that this green initiative is taken seriously. As a result, sir, you would be uh, you know, uh, very happy to learn that uh, Forest Survey of India, they have recently issued a report and 7.7% increase in Telangana's green cover. It has not happened. Fantastic. So it has not happened in the past and uh, we are very proud of it. That's the first thing. The second thing I'll tell you, sir, which again uh, could be of interest uh, to you, I'm sure it is of interest to you. The Telangana is a land of lakes and tanks. In fact, uh, we are a very undulating state uh, in terms of topography. So, sir, we have 46,000 lakes and tanks. Our Honorable Chief Minister, because of the way it is, uh, Telangana's land uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is in the topography, is yeah. the yeah. rivers too big. Yeah. Lifelines, river Krishna and Godavari, <laughs> they flow at a much lower level than the, uh, the, the yeah. land terrain. Now, what has happened is, uh, of course, we have conceptualized and built large lift irrigation projects, including the world's largest lift irrigation project called Kaleshwaram which has been completed in Telangana in a matter of four years, which is a record of sorts. But most importantly, you know, when we go to Minnesota, they tell you very proudly that they're a land of 10,000 lakes. So, but we are a state which has got 46,000 tanks in lakes. So, our Honorable Chief Minister launched a program called as Mission Kakatiya, because during the Kakatiya Kings, that's they had actually, that's when it was done, yes, they had actually built a lot of tanks and lakes. So, under this program, we've revived, strengthened and rejuvenated nearly 50% of the tanks spending almost 22,000 crores per piece. Now, what this has done is in a district like mine, for example, Sirsila, which is where I represent from, groundwater has come up by about 6 meters. And as a result, this water conservation effort of the Telangana government has become a lesson for the IAS trainees in Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy in Musori. The water conservation in my district has become a, 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 a you know, a, you know, interesting concept for them to learn, understand and study. So, sir, uh, we've done some things. Of course, there's a lot to be done. We've been also consciously trying to improve the soil health. In fact, our chief minister talks about soil health cards and how we need to reduce the usage of fertilizers and pesticides and ensure that soil is uh, uh, you know, uh, conserved and preserved. And more importantly, he also talks about intercropping and ensuring that uh, we, 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 we actually give soil room enough to breathe. So, these are broadly some things I wanted to mention, but I would love to hear from you. On your efforts for the last 30 years. Uh, Thank you once again. That's uh, wonderful to hear, <coughs> particularly the tree plantations and uh, similar events have been done in Tamil Nadu, just privately, not even involving the governments actually. 
because we unleashed a large people's movement in Tamil Nadu where millions of people participated. And today, according to the Tamil Nadu Gazette, uh, the green cover has gone up by 7.2%. According to the Google Maps, it's gone up by 11.6%. So, but this is the important thing about this is, this is on private lands. This is not on government lands. Essentially in farmlands, where we brought in what is called as tree-based agriculture in the last 27 years. Initially, we used to call it, call it agroforestry. But uh, then it fell under the forest department and we came under so many limitations. So we just had to rename it to fall under agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have a tree based agriculture and it's going very well and we're doing this in the Kaveri Basin. It is 83,000 square kilometers of land, 5.2 million farmers, uh, both between Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Puducherry. So here we are envisioning to plant 2.42 billion trees, but all on farmland. And we have evolved this method of how a farmer can grow his regular crops with trees in between, which will become an extra income and becomes the source of soil regeneration. That you use the soil, uh, you use the tree foliage to enhance the soil quality. So today, I can say about uh, 130,000 farmers, their lands have gone to average uh, organic content in Tamil Nadu was 0.68%. Today, these farmers have well over 3 to 4 percent organic content. Water tables have come up. The incredible thing is, I know you were saying as a very large example. I always believe that at least 50 to 100 acres minimum you must plant to get this water table up. But to our incredible surprise, five acres if you plant, water table comes up. This is the incredible nature of, uh, you know, that southern plateau, that five acres I see water tables have come up significantly and it stays there. So uh, right now this movement, Save Soil movement worldwide is because uh, not a single nation in the world has the 3% minimum average organic content that is necessary to keep the soil organisms alive for future generations. On an average, 27,000 species of organisms are dying or going extinct per year. At this rate, Whatever we may be doing in individual land areas will not work because uh, the soil organisms or microorganisms are a global phenomenon. They function as one big uh, life phenomenon. So without the support of all around, just one place we are doing it well, it is good. But still it doesn't really work like that. It doesn't really solve the problem for future generations. And anyway, one part of the world is far more uh, fertile than the rest of the world, whoever has the big guns on that day, they will come and take it anyway. It will happen. Once there are food shortages, people will come and take each of this land. In the last 50 years, uh, in the last 30 years, I'm sorry, in the last 50 years, 30 wars have happened in Africa, out of which 27 wars are for fertile lands. They fought mainly to take each of those fertile lands. It's not the end of the world, but it's going to be extremely painful and because of this 27,000 species lost per year, right now if you attempt regenerating the soil on the planet with the right kind of policies across the world, in 10 to 15 years time we can make a significant turnaround. But if you allow this to go beyond 30 to 40 years, after that if we try to regenerate, it is said it will take 150 to 200 years. So this will be an incredibly pain painful phase for humanity and you know, nearly a quarter or a third of the population may die because of these things. More than that, the chaos that will happen when there are food shortages, civilizations will collapse. They are expecting dozens of civil wars by 2035. And famines will not, famine means people think it will happen in Africa or somewhere else. No. They are saying Illinois will have a famine by 2035. So, this is where we are going. Because average uh, organic content in the world has come down significantly. In India, average is 0.68%, which is very, very low. This is one of the most fertile lands. Uh, Godavari, Kaveri, Ganga has yielded, you know. It has bred a whole civilizations. But today we have brought it to this place. So what we are striving for is that everywhere in the world, 
as there are urban lots in a city, see if you have 10,000 square feet of land here, you cannot build a 10,000 square feet building. There is some law, six, seven thousand you have to build and leave some space. But if you have 100 acres of land, you can plow every inch of the land. If you want, you can turn it into a desert in the next 10, 20 years time, there is no law. So we are trying to bring a law, incentive-based law, that if you own agricultural land, it's your responsibility to have minimum of 3% organic content. So for this initially, it takes incentives. Then once they reach that 3%, there is a carbon sequestering that's happening because of that. So we must crack the carbon market. The next thing is, suppose, let's say a fruit or a vegetable, let's say an apple. This comes from 1% organic content, means what micronutrients it has. 3% means what it has. Everybody knows this, there is enough science about it. So with that much extra micronutrients, what are the health benefits you get? What are the preventive health benefits you get? What are the benefits in terms of less stress in the healthcare system? What are the benefits in terms of number of mandates not being lost? Or, uh, you know, a population which is more healthy naturally is more productive and more creative. All these benefits are there. Suppose it's 6% organic content, it'll sit on a higher shelf in the marketplace. So the farmer should get three levels of incentives, one directly from the administrations, next from the carbon market, next from the marketplace. If we don't do this now and enhance farmer's income, because uh, we have made some kind of a survey in the country where right now 62% of the uh, population is in farming, not even 2% of the farmers want their children to become farmers. This is uh, one thing is the lack of income, that it's not lucrative enough to stay there. Another thing is uh, this compulsory education. Page, uh, boys and girls who don't go on the field early on, after 18, they don't even have a physic to go and survive on the land, you know. To do something hard work on the land is not possible because they have spent 18 years in school or till they're 18, they're in school. So this needs to be looked at also. But the most important thing is a farmer should earn as much as a doctor, engineer, lawyer, whatever drives people into the urban centers. They must earn at least that much. Only then we will have farmers in the next 30 years. Otherwise, we will be in a serious peril of not having enough people who know how to farm. I'm, uh, my, my experience of things is, even people who have done MSc in agriculture cannot grow a single crop. Farmer has an intrinsic knowledge about how to do this, which we are ignoring as not uh, <laughs> valuable, but we will know the value when there are food shortages. So this is, uh, I'm doing a 100 uh, day journey from London to Kaveri, which is about uh, 30,000 kilometers. I've already completed 25 nations. I'm in Dubai right now. Tonight I'm going back and continuing the journey. So uh, going to Muscat and from there I'm taking, along with my motorcycle, taking a small boat to Gujarat. And from there I'm riding all the way. I will be coming to Hyderabad. We look forward to your we'll cooperation. Of you, course. I will give you a policy document. Please examine that before that. This is a simple guideline document that farmers should benefit and it should be incentivized in such a way that he will naturally want to raise the organic content. You mentioned reduction of uh, fertilizer and pesticide. See, these are issues, but if you attempt it that way, right now I've spoken to the European uh, uh, Common Agricultural Policy people. See, they are talking about a very complex approach. It is very well thought out, well intentioned. I, I admire that. But what we need to understand is when it comes to implementation, you will not have scientists or academics implementing it. It's the former who implements it. It has to be simply one point easy to implement policy. If you have 10 things to address, for example, people are saying reduce fertilizer. I have been in agriculture myself. See if that is your field, this is my field. How much fertilizer your land demands, how much mine demands is not the same. Not always the same, I'm saying. So if you say 50% right now, you may still be able to manage crops. I may not be able to manage, then what will I do? I will get spurious stuff from somewhere and start using it, which will be far more damaging and absolutely no control. A whole lot of unnecessary things will happen. Instead of that, if we raise the organic content, the need for fertilizer will stop, start dropping down by itself. This whole urban idea 
that farmers are simply throwing uh, fertilizer on the land and destroying the land is a silly idea because f fertilizer costs so much money. Why would farmers simply throw it on the land? They don't understand in a degraded land, unless you use a certain quantum of fertilizer, nothing is going to come out of it. And above all, in the marketplace right now, if you go to this uh, any market here, it says this is organic. If this fruit is organic, what is the other fruit? Is it inorganic? This is all a marketing stunt. If you fix it, that if it is 3% and above, what is the micronutrients? There's enough science to tell us that. If you say this is from a 3% field, people know how much to pay. If you say this is from a 6% field, they know how much to pay. Our own experience has been, if you raise the organic content in the soil to 8 to 10%, the irrigation requirement comes down to 30% of what we are using right now. 100 liters will become 30 liters. That needs to happen in India. So firstly, you're a fascinating man. Uh, you know, you, you, you've touched upon so many subjects that, you know, I have so many things to say and so many questions to ask and so many, uh, you know, points to make. But uh, I just, I just make uh, three quick observations. One, talk about policy support. Um, if you could possibly point out if there are any precedents in the world where somebody has done something which you believe is worth emulation, I think uh, that would be a great start for us. That's the first thing I'd ask. The second thing, sir, <clears throat> I think every prime minister, every chief minister, you know, dreams of doubling farmers' income. You know, including our prime minister, who talked about doubling farmers' income back in 2015. Of course, for a variety of reasons, you know, that has not translated. But uh, the fact is, if you make agriculture remunerative, if you make it like you were pointing out, two percent of the farmers actually want their progeny, their kids, actually to continue in the same line of activity. That's primarily because it's not remunerative, it's not lucrative, it's not attractive enough, uh, you know, for them to want uh, their children also to do the same. Uh, so, the question I guess I'm asking is, how do we make this whole safe soil movement attractive in the sense uh, of returns as well for the farmers, making it more remunerative and lucrative? And the third, the third point I'll make, of course, we'll welcome you in, Hy in Hyderabad, and uh, more importantly, sir, I wanted to point out, uh, we are one state where the farmers are federated. In fact, we have uh, a farmer federate federations each and every village. We call them Raitu Bandhu Samitis. We have them in each and every single village in our uh, 12,769 panchayatis. And we have built what is called as Raitu Vedika. We have built, uh, we have, we have organized, uh, you know, uh, farm clusters by 5,000 acres each. And we have an agriculture extension officer and a Raitu Vedika where we where farmers sit, discuss, meet, talk, and you know, discuss best practices and other things. So we will certainly bring even the Farmer Federation Association to meet with you. Our Agriculture Minister will also come and meet you. Nancy, if Honorable Chief Minister is available, I'm sure we'll uh, set up a meeting with him as well. So my request to you is, please show us the right direction towards policy and how do we make it more remunerative. And thirdly, most importantly, how do we leverage the collective mind of farmers to make it a more impactful movement? So one, uh, one thing I would request, request is after uh, my journey is over, if uh, 25 to 50 farmers uh, from different regions who are doing different types of farming, along with one of your officers yes. who is qualified to handle that kind of situation comes to us, we will take them to different live farms where incomes have gone up between 300 to 800 percent in eight to nine years time. And the soil organic content has improved, water tables have come up. There is a way to do it. If they're willing to spend three days, we can do a certain kind of program with them after that, if you assemble 500,000 people in your place, our people will come there and uh, tell them how to go about it. Especially if you already have these Vedikas, it will be very easy to convey that message. Initially, one or two, if we do after that online, it could be carried on. Uh, any pointers towards policy and what it needs to be? Maybe? Yes. See, the policy I've also presented this at the COP15 in Ivory Coast, just now uh, the UNCCD. The important thing about the policy is that it should be so simple that everybody understands and it's implementable. Otherwise, we will end up in more and more conferences and conventions going on endlessly. Of all the UN conventions that have been held in the last few decades, the only UN convention which has brought conclusive results is the Montreal Protocol, which was about the ozone layer. Because we decided it is a single point agenda, we could turn this around. Right now, soil is in that condition. We must separate soil from all other aspects and handle it as a, an emergency aspect. On a really war footing, we need to handle this. 
Because right now, if you entangle this with fertilizer, pesticide usage, this and that, see, all these are businesses which have been built over decades. You are not going to close it down tomorrow morning. And it's not good to do that. Because today, if there is no pesticide or uh, fertilizer in the world, our food production would come down to 25% of what it is and it will be the worst disaster. So just urban populations, activists coming out on the street and shouting, close this down, close that down is not the thing. No business needs to be beaten down. Businesses need to be transformed. For transformation, incentives and time is required. So we can work towards that. There is enough technology today, we can work towards transformation of these businesses. But nobody should continuously talk against them. Once you talk against them, it's their survival and they will start doing their own things. It's an unnecessary reality. One thing all of us must understand is, whether we like it or we don't like it, all of us have been partners in this destruction. All of us should become partners in the solution. That's the only way forward. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, privilege, honor. Thank you, sir. And I will welcome you. We look forward to working with Mr. Telangana. Absolutely.